Assalamu alaikum. You're listening to the New Beginnings podcast. No fluff, no holding back. Just honest conversations about your journey as a new Muslim. Brought to you by New Beginnings, a platform that aims to support new Muslims on their journey through Islam from the Shahada and beyond. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to all our listeners. This is the New Beginnings podcast. I'm Amanda and as always I'm here with our co-host Sheikh Bilal. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, this episode we're going to be looking at a very important question and one that we frequently get asked at New Beginnings which is how do I know I'm ready to convert to Islam? Yeah for anyone involved in mentoring new Muslims or in da'wah this is definitely something we hear a lot. To help us unpack this we're joined today by not one but three guests mashallah we have Samantha, Monica and Martin with us today. Thank you all for joining us. So before we get into the main topic of discussion can you all introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from? Samantha do you want to go first? Assalamu alaikum. I'm Samantha and I'm from Wales originally but I've been living in Australia for 11 years. Um, I took my shahada in March 2021, so I've been Muslim for just over a year now. I'll have to do that. Um, I actually celebrated my one-year anniversary doing Umrah in Mecca, and it was such a wonderful, life-changing experience. I pray we all get to go soon. I mean, um, since taking my shahada, I quit my job as a critical care nurse, and I've been taking the time to study um, Islam more in depth. And it's actually my dream one day to um, teach and help others. So you're and you're joining us all the way from Australia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Jazakal khair for that. Uh, Monica. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Monica. I'm from Dublin, um, but I live in Belfast. And I took my shahada in January 2021 with New Beginnings. So I've been Muslim just over a year. Alhamdulillah. And then finally, Martin, you've been on the program before. Assalamu alaikum. Nice to see you again, guys. Um, I'm Martin from Cardiff. No, not 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 as uh, impressive as living in Australia or anything at the moment. Still living in Cardiff. Um, been Muslim six years now. Actually, it'll be six years this month. Thinking about it. Jazakallah khair for coming on. Okay, it's great to have you all in the podcast, and I'm looking forward to hearing your views on this. So the topic today is: How do I know I'm ready to convert to Islam? Now, obviously. This isn't an easy one-size-fits-all kind of question. Otherwise, we wouldn't devote an entire podcast to it. But as we are all converts here, mashallah, I'd like to ask us all to share. How long did we all take to convert? So between first encountering Islam, seriously, to actually taking the shahada, how long did each of us take? Um, let's start with Monica. Um, so... To when I actually seriously um, was considering Islam, I think it was only about just over a month. So I had started the New Beginnings course in the December um, and then I took my Shahada at the end of January. Um, so, yeah, it was probably only about six weeks. But I mean, I, ha I had, you know, been interested in Islam for <clears throat> many years before that, since I was a child. So it kind of wasn't, I think it was just a natural progression, really. I mean, I was... Yeah. Once I started doing the course, I instantly knew that I was going to do it. And then actually it was when somebody had said to me, um, you know, what, what was stopping me from from doing it? Um, and I was like, I just need to be ready. <laughs> and they were like, well, but if you already believe everything, um, you know, you should just do it. And so, yeah, I did. So six weeks of actual in-depth study, but then years yeah. and years prior to that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. How about you, Martin? Um, so my first encounter with a Muslim was 18 years prior to my shahada. Um, that wasn't me studying properly. So, um, but actual properly looking into it, reading books um, and trying to work out how not to be a Muslim, because I didn't actually want to become a Muslim, <laughs> was uh, five years I think a lot of that was because it was my own research, reading books. I didn't have um, proper guidance or s a structure to follow to tr or people to speak to to try and find the best way to go. Um, so, yeah, five actual years of study, but about 18 years of actually being interested in Islam. Sheikh Bilal, what about yourself? Um, so for me, um, I actually came across the Quran when I was about 19, 18 or 19, I think. and I read a couple of chapters and then I just put it aside 
But really at that moment, I did actually believe everything that was in the Quran. And um, I didn't actually choose to enter into Islam. It just sort of like happened. Uh, they say, you know, sometimes, you know, we don't choose Islam, but Islam chooses us. So that was the case for me. It was like Islam chose chose me just by, by coincidence. I, you know, I met somebody who was uh, out preaching. He was a convert himself and he's just... He was asking me about my beliefs. And I said, yes, I believe in the Quran. I believe in, you know, everything that's in the, the Prophet Muhammad and everything. And he said, basically, your, your, your beliefs are already in line with Islam. You're already a Muslim and uh, you just need to announce it. And, you know, I did that probably about a year and a half after, you know, my first reading of the Quran. But when I converted, I didn't really know anything about the religion. I just knew that um, the Quran was true and, uh, this was the right thing to do. Uh, so how about you, Amanda? That's a good question. I think between first meeting my colleague, who was also a convert to Islam, um, who was she was really sort of um, instrumental in triggering me to look into Islam, because prior to that, I was a complete Islamophobe. I knew nothing. And I knew all of the tropes. That was it. Um, so between meeting her and actually taking Shahada was about two and a half years. And it, it was about two and a half years of sort of, like Martin said, not wanting to be Muslim because, oh my God, <laughs> you know, why would I want to do that to myself? Um, but not being able to avoid it either, not being able to deny it anymore. So there was a lot of internal conflict in that sense that happened. But yeah, I'd say about two, two years, two and a half years, subhanAllah. Oh, that's I'm uh, interested in uh, Martin. He said that he was avoiding, actually avoiding, trying to avoid Islam. Uh, so I'd just like to know more about that, really. I think it's more about giving up my nafs, like giving up the casino, the poker, the uh, just doing what I wanted, when I wanted, not having to pray five times a day, all that sort of stuff, the, the core basics of Islam. Um, and part of it as well was... Like obviously there's new beginnings, there's places like that now where people come and get better knowledge and guidance. Whereas I was on my own with books, not I, I looking back now, I was probably ready within six months of of reading, but I never had somebody there to say, So what do you actually believe? Okay, do you believe in the Quran? Do you believe in the Prophet, peace be upon him? Do you believe in X, Y, and Z? And I think Tan Tanvia says says it to some of the new new Muslims sorry, one of the guys involved in the new Muslim scene in Cardiff, he says it quite a lot to people is you already believe in your heart, but you haven't actually spoken the words. So you need to sort of let it, let it out and just say your shahada. Cause I think a lot of us at the time are scared just because of those things, like the, the, the thought of, Oh, I've got to change my life, life overnight, which is ridiculous. Now looking back, you th think you've got to flick a switch and change everything overnight. But, but yeah, I probably would have taken my shahada, probably four and a half years earlier if I'd uh, had the right guidance, like New Beginnings and other organisations like that. No, so Yeah, I think uh, it was the case with me. There was a lot of fear. I was living a chaotic lifestyle. And I thought there's no way that I can uh, ever be a Muslim right now. So I think that fear of uh, maybe the unknown or having, you think we have to make all of these drastic changes immediately, that does uh, hold quite a few of us back from actually becoming Muslim. We've got Samantha back with us now. Alhamdulillah. Samantha. Testing, testing. Yes, we can hear you. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay, great. So um, we were asking, how long did it take us to convert between encountering Islam seriously and actually taking the Shahada? From encountering Islam and from to taking my Shahada, it took me about six months of um, going really deep and studying and reading and seriously asking a lot of questions to see if it was the right fit for me and and all that kind of stuff so my, my actual journey to islam is a lot longer and I, I cover all of that in my convert story which um new beginnings has on the website so if anyone's interested in reading that that they're more than welcome to but yeah so it was in, in a nutshell i'd converted to christianity made a huge mistake realized it wasn't for me so i didn't want to make that mistake again so even though in my heart, as soon as I started learning about Islam, I knew it was um, it was me coming home. I, I decided to really take the time to do it properly, like to to go deep, to make sure that I was happy with everything, that there was there wasn't anything that I disagreed with, and 
just to, you know, just to be emotionally ready to take that step because it's, it's a way of life. It's not just a religion, it's a way of life. And it was important for me because uh, seeking God is something I've done all my life. And I wanted to, you know, make, make the full commitment. And um, yeah, so I found, I found the new beginnings team, the firm foundations was just about to start up. So subhanAllah, it it was a great timing. And when I came to it, came to the end of that in February, 2021, that's when I realized, yeah, I'm, I'm good to go. I've got the, I've got the foundations of the faith. I I know what I'm doing sort of, and um, there's nothing else holding me back. I think it's interesting how you, took the firm foundations course after before taking shahada um you know taking that you you felt that now you know you know what you're doing you've got the foundations because that is completely the opposite from how a lot of people are often encouraged to do things we're sort of encouraged to you know oh no just just do the shahada and then you can learn as you go along yeah and, and i think there's there's benefits to both ways because I would I would always recommend that people don't delay their shahada because I think once you have the belief there and you have the conviction in your heart, I think you're you're already Muslim in your heart as long as you believe in the six articles of faith and and all that. Um, you're already Muslim, but we're all individual. We all have personal um relationships with God, and we're all taking our own personal journeys. So I, I can see like how it is important to take take your shahada as soon as possible, but at the same time, you're ready when you're ready. And I think we have to respect that in people. And one one thing that I found with New Beginnings was having that safe place to come to ask questions and seek, you know, again, the support from your fellow converts who are people just like you and you can relate to them and they, they know the challenges that you're going through. That that really helps. It It really helps to have that um, sort of like safety net underneath you. It it just encourages you, and it, it it makes it a lot less daunting to make that final decision to take the plunge, as we speak. Yeah, and of course, at a new beginning, we don't ever pressurize anyone to uh, to convert to Islam. It's always in their own time, and whenever they're they're ready. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the safe space allowing us room to grow to ask questions there's there's no judgment there's no anything it's it's just all encouragement in a safe gentle way and it is fantastic for for people who are coming to the faith so this brings us on to the next question actually i think it might be a no for most of us but did any of us ever feel pressured to convert before we were really ready i would hope that the answer is no but in my case yes Definitely. There were certain people who, and and bearing in mind that I converted um, in 1997, 1998. So, you know, the the scene of convert care and convert support was very, very different back then. In fact, it was pretty much, I'm not going to say it was non-existent because um, Batul, Auntie Batul's um, New Muslim Project existed back then, but that was basically it. So there wasn't new beginnings. There was no new Muslim clubs. There were no halakas specifically for no, for new Muslims. It was sink or swim. And I was at university and I was basically, I was at that weird in-between stage where I was a Muslim. I believed I was praying. I was going to all the activities. I had joined the ISOC and all of that stuff, but I had not taken shahada officially. And most people did not realize that about me. They assumed that I had already done it. And so when people found out that I didn't, that's when the pressure came. That was the, well, what's holding you back? What's the issue? What's the, you know, why aren't you? And the fact of the matter was, it, it wasn't, I wasn't ready. It wasn't, it hadn't settled in my heart yet a hundred percent. It had and it hadn't. It was a very strange sort of state. And plus I had, you know, things in my head about, I want my family to be on board. I, I don't want to disappoint my parents, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, there definitely was pressure. And I think that's why, you know, there are times when people ask you what's holding you back that can be detrimental. And there are times when people ask you that and it's the trigger that you need. It's that nudge that you need. So I'm always very cautious about saying anything like that to anybody. So, but yeah, definitely I did experience that. And I I wonder if anybody else has. I mean, Sheikh Bilal, you converted around the same era that I did, (laughs) mashallah. Others are more recent. And I'm wondering if it, if that sort of that culture and that mindset in the communities has changed much. With regards to my shahada, I wasn't actually looking to take it at the time. Um, I was invited around for iftar. 
uh, around one of my friends' houses. And like I, said, I think I said my story previously on a podcast, but um, basically the, the, there was a shake there that, that I was going to ask questions because, again, looking for an excuse not to become Muslim, I thought oh, I may, may be able to trip him up and get get an excuse. Um, but, yeah, he made a beeline for me being the token white guy in the room because um, there was all a- Asians everywhere. Um, and he just started asking me the questions. Like, like I think it was Samantha said, the six articles, the five pillars. And uh, and he's just said to me, he's like, you are a Muslim. Because I, I was fasting for Ramadan at the time and stuff. And it's just, and he was like, you are Muslim. And he just said to me, sit down. And initially I was like, why, why is he telling me to sit down? And then he told everybody else to sit down. And I realized what was going on. And that was the, the kick up the backside I needed, I guess. Because if it was left to me, I would have, my nuffs would have kept saying, no, 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 go to the casino, go enjoy your life, go do this or that. So, um, so in my situation, I think the pressure was a good thing because I don't know if I ever would have got to that point. Um, or I would have, because obviously we all know that Allah's got a plan for us, but, um, yeah, I think in my personal situation, I needed that sort of little incentive, let's say, to, to take that step. Yeah, it's, yeah. Sometimes the pressure is uh, is is a good thing. I was still very young when I converted, and I didn't really uh, come across people who were actively call, inviting people to to come to Islam. Even though I had Muslim friends, but I think in the after like two thousand, after I converted, and there was a I realized there was this like this stronger uh, dawa scene where you know people would go out into you know, the town centers or outside universities and, you know, they actively invite people to come to Islam. Sometimes people, they do need that pressure, but it needs to be done with wisdom. It needs to be done in, in the right way and not an aggressive manner. So, you know, we used to see these Dawa organizations going out and they, sometimes they get quite aggressive, uh, which is not the prophetic way, really. So sometimes pressure is good, yes. And we have the example of the Prophet Muhammad where he's, he invites Abu Sufyan to Islam, you know, and they ask him, why is it taking you so long, Abu Sufyan? You know, he's he's a messenger of Allah. Uh, so it needs to be done in, in the right way, that, that pressure, and with a lot of wisdom, I think. I find it really interesting that you bring up the whole um, good pressure, bad pressure. I think that's really interesting. And one of the things that I, I really hate is um you know you know like when you're on the streets i uh, in cities and things and you've, you've got the whoever they are coming coming up and trying to convert you convert you and they, they're trying to guilt trip you into their faith and it's just not the right way like it just it just brings up walls like it doesn't it doesn't help anyone to come to the faith under duress and i think that's really interesting like how you guys are saying that there's, there's, there is good pressure that will motivate you and give you the incentive to follow the, the right path and then there's the bad pressure which will just turn you away and, and that's the balance that we have to find as muslims as, as you know when we're giving dawah to people it is finding that balance of when someone needs that bit of push and then when someone needs a bit of gentleness and just that safe place to um come to the religion by themselves yeah i think what what you've said is really important and to be honest i don't think that that's something that you can gauge unless you know the person you're talking to really well, like, you know, I would never, you know, I've, I've never met Monica before today, other than on a a telegram group, mashallah. I would never think that I can walk up to her and say, you know, so are you ready? What's holding you back? Because I don't know her. I don't know her situation. I don't know her. Do you know what I mean? And I've seen, you know, subhanAllah, just to sort of highlight how this pressure does exist. There is a sister who, um, Allah yarhamha, she passed away a couple of years ago, but she had been looking into Islam for years, like we're talking decades, and she was coming to the mosque, she was praying with us, she was fasting in Ramadan, and she was an older lady, so I think that a lot of people sort of had a a bit of anxiety about not letting her die, unless she had been taking her shahada, and she was in the mosque once for a workshop, and a very well-meaning lady went up to her and started putting the pressure on about, you know, why haven't you taken to the shahada yet, why haven't you done this yet, And the poor sister burst into tears because she just simply wasn't ready yet. And I had to literally, you know, sort of remove her from the situation and, you know, get her into another room and get her calmed down. Um, And the fact of the matter was, you know, 
she was praying and she was fasting and she was believing, you know, subhanAllah, if she hadn't taken shahada before she died, you know, I, I like to think that Allah knew what was in her heart because she was living her life as a Muslim. She just hadn't taken that step to get the piece of paper, basically, from the mosque. It was a real technicality at that point. But I do think that, you know, people mean well, they don't want to, you know, oh, we can't let them die on kufr. But if you're practicing the faith already, if you're already there, it is somewhat of a technicality. Sheikh Bilal, what do you think about this? Because I know this question has come up as well in terms of, you know, but, but from a theological point of view, is it necessary to do it publicly and get the shahad, get the certificate and everything to be considered Muslim in Allah's eyes? Yeah, it's, um, for, you know, for some people, it's it's a numbers game, uh, you know, and they're like boasting, oh, I've done um, 50 shahadas today and I've just boasted before the podcast, actually, but it wasn't to boast, it was just, just to let you know what's going on. But it's, it's not a numbers game. And uh, we have to remember that shahad is just a formality. It's just, just an event. And there are you know, people that might already be practicing Islam, they're already fasting and praying, they already believe everything. To me, they're Muslim. They're, they're already Muslim. And that, that outward practice that they have, um, the scholars have mentioned that that's a sign of their Islam and they can be accepted as a Muslim just by performing something that is uh, one of the, you know, specific acts of worship of Islam. That's an indication that they're already Muslim. So the shahada is just uh, it's just a formality, really, after that. Uh, but I think we get too caught up on this shahada and, you know, it has to be in Arabic, otherwise you're not Muslim. And if you haven't said it, you're, it's not like, <laughs> you know, now you, one day you say the shahada and you're, you're Muslim and then a minute ago you weren't a Muslim. It's just an outward, it's just there for, as an outward sign that the person is a Muslim. So everybody knows that this person is now a Muslim. It's more a sociological thing, isn't it? It's it's for the Muslim community to recognize you as a Muslim. It's nothing to do with your relationship with Allah, is it? Exactly, yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's a sociological uh, matter. So we can recognize that this person is, is a Muslim because of the definition of Islam and the definition of faith uh, in the books of theology, it's uh, belief in the heart, conviction in the heart, and confirmation on the tongue. What they mean by confirmation on the tongue is an outward sign that the person is a Muslim. Monica, how about yourself? I know I know that Samantha's got her hand up, but Monica, you haven't had a chance to answer this question. Did you get any pressure to convert before you were ready? No, none whatsoever. Um, I mean, obviously I took my shahada with new beginning. So as Samantha was saying, I mean, it is a really safe space Um and so it just kind of felt, although I was obviously very nervous and like what how Martin was saying about that kind of fear of, you know, your life is just going to have to change instantly. And, you know, and as well, fear of actually telling people. And, and I think that's probably one of the things that held me back from looking further into Islam over the years was more about, you know, well, how would that kind of go in line with my life and what would people think and would my family accept it and but with new beginnings, I think because they're so supportive and and so reassuring that it was easier, that kind of stuff I could set to the side because it was always, you know, you can go at your own pace. You don't need to, you know, change overnight. And, you know, Imran would have always said Rome wasn't built in a day. So, you know, and um, so, yeah, thankfully I didn't. And I do hear stories, obviously, and I, I feel very grateful, alhamdulillah, that I've actually not experienced a lot of things that new Muslims do either before or after um, they take their shahada. And and I really do put that down to new beginnings um, because they really just have created such a great community. Um, so, yeah, alhamdulillah. On the top, like it sort of harks back to the pressure that we were speaking about earlier about, um, you know, the, the pressure that some people feel, oh, I need to do this to achieve this certificate and I need to have a piece of paper to prove this, that and the other. And it takes uh, takes the attention off what we're actually doing. And we're, we're just affirming, like we're affirming what we already believe in our hearts. Allah knows our hearts. He knows us better than anyone so having that piece of paper, yeah, it, it can be special for some people. It can be an accomplishment. It can be something that you can hang on your wall. But at the end of the day, what we're doing is making making our pledge, making you know, make, making that sort of statement that we are 
Muslims. And it's funny because um, I, I didn't have a certificate. I, I've had, um, you know, I've been Muslim for over a year. I've just got uh, something from the imam in my local mosque just to say that I'm Muslim, just so I could go to Mecca. And if anyone asked any questions that I'd have, you know, the proof, which, you know, it, it can be quite insulting for converts, especially, you know, like we, we've gone through the journey, we've gone through our trials and tribulations and the, the you know, the, the agonizing sometimes decisions of, you know, what we're doing and how it's going to affect our life and things. And then to have our faith questioned by, you know, pe- people who have no idea what we've gone through. So it's it's a it's a two-way street sometimes. And I think, um, you know, if it's important to you, great. And if it's not, then there's no need for it. As long as you are, you've made that, um, you know, affirmation with, with Allah and, you know, you're on the right path, basically. If, if you've accepted Islam, you're on the right path, inshallah. I think we've all made some really good points. Now, we've already, the next question that we have, um, I think we've touched on it. But maybe if we can go into a little, a little bit more, for those of us who took longer getting there, what were some things that held us back? Martin, you've talked about your nafs. I think a lot of us, that would be the main one. But there might be other issues that are holding people back. Could we talk about that a little bit more? And more importantly, how did we resolve them? Martin, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sorry. So with regards to the, the nafs, um, your desires, just in case people don't know what nafs are. Um, my re- mine was resolved by knowing that I didn't have to change overnight. Like the sheikh who took my shahada with me was like, look, the, the Quran was revealed over 23 years and it took the sahaba that long to purify their Islam. So we get lots of pressure from born Muslims, uh, even other converts. Let's not, let's not point the finger at born Muslims. Um, that you have to change overnight. Sister, why aren't you wearing a hijab? Why haven't you gotten a buyer? Brother, where's your beard? Like these things were revealed over 23 years. Um, and I think that's the massive pressure people feel. Oh, well, I'm still sinning. Like I'm involved in a lot of the new Muslim stuff in Cardiff. And I've I've had uh how could I word this properly? <laughs> actively gay people come to me believing in Islam. There's five pillars, the six articles. And they're like, what do I do? Do I take my shahada and work on my sin? Or do I fix my sin before taking my shahada? Personally, I always say it's better to be a Muslim who sins than a sinner that's not Muslim. Um, Because let's be honest, the five of us here all sin. Inshallah, it's not as bad as some things that we could be doing. But so, yeah, that's my, my, was my, revelation i guess by that shake he said don't expect to change overnight um because it's too much pressure you can't flick that switch and become 100 percent muslim overnight because it'll be too hard and you'll break and you'll you'll walk away i think we both had a similar journey martin and i and um the preacher who i took my shahada with he said a similar thing to me he actually said it's okay you keep a keep your girlfriend but make sure you pray five times a day which is probably bad advice <laughs> but the point he was trying to get across is like don't change don't try to change everything uh all at once and um like samantha has mentioned you know rome wasn't wasn't built in a day yeah so for me it was was that fear of having to undergo such a drastic change in my life and you know give up the things that i'm doing and uh just feeling not ready for it I think uh, little things hold us back as well. Like um, what society is going to think of us, uh, especially for women, because obviously we have the obligation of the hijab. So we're a lot more vis- visibly Muslim. So we're, we sometimes become a target, especially if we're living in, you know, not so uh, understanding societies. Like, you know, we're, we're, if we're living in a, like where I was living before, in a very rural area, you might be the only Muslim in town. And it's, you know, it becomes a, a, that might become something that holds someone back. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good point that shouldn't be underestimated. And women, especially when we're talking about pressure, we are pressurized to start wearing hijab straight away. Like, you know, I, I know people, I know sisters who took their shahada and the next day were wearing hijab and niqab, you know, the face veil and everything. They don't know how to pray yet. But they've had this family pressure because maybe they converted because they're, you know, getting married to a, to, a, to a Muslim lad or something like that. And they've got this extreme 
pressure to conform visually to what a Muslim should look like, but within themselves, they're not ready yet. And that can be very, very daunting, I think, and that can pe- put people off too. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think um, kind of around that, about what other people, you know, how they were going to take the news that I'd become Muslim and particularly family and friends and, and work. And I think one of the the good things about New Beginning was was that I didn't kind of feel because they talk about taking your time I actually didn't tell anybody that I had converted until nine months later um so I was I was practicing but I hadn't I I hadn't started wearing hijab and actually it was only after I'd started wearing hijab that I about a month later when you know people were probably thinking what's going on here I then slowly started to (laughs) you know tell people so the word spread but I think remembering that actually there's no there's no right or wrong way to do it. You know, you don't have to tell everybody. I mean, if you decide to become Muslim today, it doesn't mean you have to go and declare it to the rest of the world straight away. You can take your time with it um, and and find your feet. And I think it's kind of what we were saying earlier about, um, you know, should you learn everything before you take your Shahada or should you take your Shahada first and then, you know, learn. And I think, as Samantha said, it's different for everyone and there's pros and cons to both. And for me personally, I think if I had waited until I, you know, knew enough or I I still wouldn't have taken it because everyone's circumstances are different, how everybody learns and stuff. So it would have taken me a really, really long time. And I mean, we, even do now, we ever know enough? Well, exactly. <laughs> I've started level two with Sheikh Bilal and he asked a question the other day, which I got the answer wrong. And he was like, Mike, that's level one. We did that like in the first class. And I'm like, maybe I'm in the wrong class. <laughs> but again, I think it's, you know, we, we all have different lives and we learn at different paces. And but yeah, I think what holds you back sometimes is it can be family and, and your environment. Um, and I think for me, it was realizing that. I could just keep this to myself until I felt ready. Um, And obviously with the support of New Beginnings, I had that outlet to kind of talk to people about my worries and concerns and and get advice. And so that really is helpful. And yeah, I, you know what, I even listen to you guys talking about your experiences and other people I've heard from as well. I feel so lucky that I've never felt any of that pressure. and, And actually by keeping it to myself and getting more confident, like when I did eventually start to tell people the, you know, the reactions I got were not what I expected. You know, people were very accepting. My family, I just couldn't, couldn't believe I was expecting this. You know, I'd done some bad things according to them, but this was going to be the the nail in the coffin. You know, people were, you know, never going to recover from this. And alhamdulillah, they've, you know, they don't always understand it, but they, they, you know, they accept me. Um, same with work and and even wearing hijab. I mean, I live in Belfast. So there's a very, very small Muslim community. You know, I can be the only person in a hijab in most places I go. But I've I've never felt uncomfortable. I've never felt it's an issue with anybody. So I do feel very fortunate. Yeah, I just wanted to echo Monica's words um, regarding family. And I think that's one of the major um, challenges and, and obstacles for someone who's coming to Islam and converting and things. That's, that's something that they worry about a lot. And for me personally, I still haven't told my family. Um, I'm halfway around the world. I'm free to do what I want. I'm living my life as a, as a happy Muslim woman. But I do recognize that, that you know, there is, uh, you know, it is going to be a time where I'm going to have to tell my family and I'm praying and praying and praying that they accept me. And I ask you to keep me in your du'as um, because, you know, I, I'm feeling more and more ready. I wanted to give myself that that first year of just really becoming comfortable and strong in my faith to be able to answer the questions that, that are going to come because, you know, your family or your family, they're going to be concerned about your your choices. They're going to be concerned if you've been brainwashed or, you know, where, where you're getting your information from. So, it, it was really important for me to have that time just to build my faith for myself and, and be ready, basically. So, yeah, I just want to echo what Monica was saying that, you know, for, for a lot of people and, you know, my, my thoughts go out to everyone who who is, you know, who's struggling, who might be kicked out of their house or might be rejected or anything. So we, we have to recognize that people face some real challenges um, in making this decision and, you know, creating that safe space like community community groups, um, convert care, all that kind of stuff is so, so important for these people. So the next question is, 
Did any of us experience major setbacks or crises of faith on the way? Um, I'll, I'll talk about that because I've actually just recently suffered that. Um, probably in, I'm, I'm OK these last couple of weeks, but I probably had about two or three weeks um, where I've got a lot of things going on and something had happened, which just kind of made me I, I struggled with you know, the idea of having to accept what um, Allah decrees for us and what his plan is and how, you know, how did I, how do I kind of like, if, if it's something that I don't want or I do want, um, how and how can I be grateful and, you know, and just accept that that's the way it's supposed to be. So I actually had a few weeks of really kind of questioning whether I was up to, you know, <laughs> being a Muslim or whether Islam actually was for me because I, I I almost had this guilt as well that it was like I, I don't think I can accept this even though I know I should and I know it's you know but it's not what I want um and I'm not happy about it <laughs> um and you know and that and, and I didn't want to go down the road of like you know well why is this happening and questioning a lot but um I even considered you know wearing the it was just a weird time actually those few weeks because you know, I've been wearing hijab from September of last year and, you know, it, it, it was it wasn't planned. It just happened and it felt so natural and it just feels part of me. Whereas when I was going through that time in those few weeks, my hijab suddenly became really apparent. It was like I felt it, you know, and I, I and I hadn't felt that before. Um, and that was a real struggle. It was really upsetting because I just it kind of had just come out of nowhere. Um, and so, yeah, I really struggled with that, but, you know, because new beginnings are so amazing, <laughs> um, you know, I reached out to Ramela, um, and spoke to her about it and, you know, she gave me some really good advice and, um, that really kind of helped ground me and, and refocus. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of quite difficult. I hadn't expected that, I suppose, because my journey has been quite, um, easy so far, if you like. I'd never kind of, you know, thought that there would come a point where I would question, is this really for me? Or I think it was more even that I'm not kind of, you know, I'm not good enough to be a Muslim. <laughs> you know, I'm not like, you know, I'm not strong enough for. But yeah, so um, I, I have experienced that. Um, but I'm happy to say I've. I've gotten over that little hurdle for now anyway. <laughs> I think that's a really common thing that a lot of new sisters especially with hijab can face um and it's rarely ever about the hijab I've noticed it's usually about something underlying and then like you said suddenly your hijab feels very very heavy on your head and you start thinking am I even good enough to be wearing this am I good enough to be and for some of us on the way to becoming Muslim on the way to being ready to take the shahada we start thinking like that you know Am I good enough to be like these women who I'm meeting with, with these sisters in Islam? Am I, am I, am I on par with them? Will I ever be ready? Will I ever be good enough? And you know, subhanAllah, like like we all like we've been saying, we all, you know, let's be honest, none of us are good enough. We 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 will only ever attain Jannah from Allah's mercy, not because we're good enough, not because we deserve it. So we shouldn't let that hold us back from trying, you know, from trying to achieve that mercy. And subhanAllah, Allah's mercy is there because we are so flawed, because we are so, you know, sinful and making mistakes all the time and so on. And I think too, you know, subhanAllah, our journeys aren't linear. We zigzag all over the place. We go back and forth and we may have days where it might be that our hijab is too much. It might be that praying five times a day is too much, which is pretty foundational. It might be that, you know, oh my gosh, Ramadan is coming again, and am I going to be able to survive kind of thing? And then we have other days where, alhamdulillah, everything goes easy, and that's part of it. SubhanAllah. Martin, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I don't know whether I'd call it a crisis of faith so, so much, but um, it was the loneliness after taking your shahada, after all the hugs and kisses, and oh, alhamdulillah, welcome to the brotherhood, and then it's like, off you go then. <laughs> um, and then you're left to your own devices. I Because I didn't have something as a, like New Beginnings or a new Muslim club like or something. I, I didn't actually know of any of this sort of stuff. Um, 
so if I had that, then I think it would have been a good good to have that community. But I was properly just in my own house, doing my own thing, living in Kafili, which yeah, there's no mosque. It was like so it was the so where do I go now sort of moment? What do I do? Is, have I made the right decision? Because your old lifestyle doesn't fit with your new lifestyle and you just got nobody to speak to or go to. Um so yeah, it was a t- it was a tough time, and then I I was working in Newport, um, and it was only because of the f- the f- Juma on a Friday that I met someone, and they helped guide me to um, it was Aira at the time going through their course. I I think it was Monica who said that she was struggling to answer the question from we uh, uh, the first session rather, which should have been should should have been known for the second session, and I find that. We all do that. We all compare ourselves to others. We and we all learn at different rates. Like you'd look at a Muslim, Muslim who took a shahada yesterday, and he already knows Al Fatiha. And I've been Muslim six months, and I'm struggling with it. And I think that causes a massive crisis of faith to some people because they think I'm not good enough. I'm not practicing. I'm not. I'm not where I should be. It's not. Um, it's not a race. We all uh, go on our own journey. Um, and we should never compare ourselves to to anybody else. I think that's a really good point. The support is really important, even before taking the shahada, like for people who are interested. Yeah, just to echo what seems to be the the key theme here is the the highs and lows of iman. So, you know, when you first convert and you're you're in that high, you're happy. It's, it's all the hugs and the kisses, and you feel wonderful. And then it's the, the it's the following months, and then it's the struggles that you face. There's the little challenges. It's the it's the ju- well the perceived judgments that you might have and things. And it's the case of learning where to go when you when you feel like that. And and one thing that some I'm I'm guilty of is sometimes when my iman is a bit low, I'm I'm feeling a bit down. I tend to forget that I can go to Allah. I can I can hit my mat and pray and just speak with Allah. Sometimes we we go through the motions. We we we're praying salah. We we might be doing dhikr if we if we're you know of a mind to, and we're we're forgetting that we can actually just sit there and speak with Allah, and and that's something that I'm working on. And that you know that's something that I'm having to remind myself sometimes is that when when times are difficult, that's when you turn to Allah, and He will always be there for you. He's He's the one constant in your life, and that's that's what gets me through. Like when, when you know, Islam is a lifelong journey and we have to accept the fact that we're going to have ups and downs, but Allah, inshallah, will always be there for us. Mashallah, that's really poignant and a good reminder. Um, I want to share two experiences that I had before I actually took Shahada, which were, I don't know if I want to say that they were setbacks because for me personally, they didn't set me back, but they were um, definitely evidence that when you're looking into Islam and considering Islam, Shaitan is doing his best to make sure that you don't get there. I had two experiences, and both of them with my friend Golnaz, who I'm going to give her a shout out right now. She's the sister who took me to take Shahada. Absolutely beautiful sister. Anybody ever wants to learn Islamic calligraphy, she is your person. Um, But she took me to London Central Mosque for Jumar one day. And this is before, a couple of months before I actually took the Shahada. And a woman, when I was going into the women's area, there was a woman at the door who clocked that I was not Muslim somehow. I don't know how because I was wearing hijab, but she somehow clocked that something wasn't quite there with me. And she asked me how long I'd been Muslim. And I said to her, I haven't taken the shahada yet. So she made me sit outside. She wouldn't let me into the prayer area because, and I quote, you're not clean yet. And my friend was shocked. She was absolutely shocked. And subhanAllah, a couple of the women in the prayer area heard her say this and had a go at her. And next thing I knew, I had all of these women shouting at each other in Arabic over my head. I was fine to sit outside and just observe. (laughs) You know, I, I was, you know, I could do that if that was the rule. But they were arguing about this over me. And I think that that was probably one of the most upsetting experiences I've ever had. The fact that my existence triggered a fight in the mosque, subhanAllah. So that was one. The second one was the day before I went to the mosque to take the shahada. Um, as I said before, I was at university and 
I was into everything, everything that the ISOC had going on, I was doing. And I was at SOAS, which is School of Oriental and African Studies, a very, very big Muslim community in that university and very political. So I went along to an event that was about Israel and Palestine. I talk about out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> and I decided to go along to this event because I thought it sounded interesting. I was interested in the issue. I knew nothing about the issue, but I was interested in it. That event got hijacked by a particular political Muslim group who were very, very vocal. I will not name them. They don't exist anymore in the UK, but they were very, very loud and lots of shouting and lots of telling people that they were going to hell. And there was a Jewish girl sitting next to me who was so scared that I just instinctively, I just hugged her because, and I was like, you know, they're all full of hot air. Just ignore them. They're just young men. They don't know what they're saying. You know, don't worry about it. And next thing I knew, because I'm trying to comfort this poor young girl, I've got this guy who's probably about six foot two, massive guy, thobe, big beard and everything comes shouting at me that I'm going to the hellfire unless I accept Islam. And I remember I just looked at him and I went, you know what? I was going to go to the mosque tomorrow to take Shahada, but you're making me think twice. And he wasn't making me think twice. I knew that this kid was like just a bunch of hot air and not representative of Muslims. But subhanAllah, it so easily could have gone another way. And there could have been other people there who they did put off completely. And alhamdulillah, I said what I said to him because it shut him up. But, you know, these were two things that sort of said to me, Somebody doesn't want you to be Muslim. Why? And it really made me sort of think deeply that am I on the right path? And alhamdulillah for Allah's hidayah, for Allah's guidance, because, you know, I realized from those experiences that, no, this is the right path. Because these are the same kind of tests that Muslims have always gone through. But yeah, it so easily could have been very, very negative, both of those experiences. And subhanAllah, both from other Muslims. You know, not from we worry so much about how will our families react, how will, how will society react. But subhanAllah, sometimes the biggest tests come from other Muslims. SubhanAllah. May Allah guide us. I think for me, um, not setbacks, but because I converted in a bit of an ad hoc way and I wasn't absolutely convinced of Islam when I converted, actually. I just felt like it was the right thing. Um, it was more like the more that I went on and the more I learned about Islam the more guidance and grace I receive from, from Allah. And um, you do get doubts. I think, I don't know, maybe all converts, they will get doubts at some point in their mind. But I always go back to, you know, why I became Muslim in the first place. And maybe, you know, some of us are very early on. So maybe in a few years' time, you'll, you'll realize that, you know, I've been getting doubts at some point in my life. But I think go back to what made me become Muslim in the first place. And um, after I converted, I actually had a lot of spiritual experiences and uh, what I call miracles, actually, that happened to me, which I won't go into now on this podcast, that actually um, just kept me, you know, I'd make dua for something, and for example, and that would that would actually happen. Really, really uh, bizarre scenarios and uh, some other things that happened to me as well. And those things actually increased me in my, my faith and increased me in my certainty. And then when I went to study, the religion formally and knowing more about the different sciences of the religion and the detail and the nuance and uh, all of those things that just solidify your your faith okay so guys we've talked a lot about our journeys and the doubts and the hiccups and the back and forth and the the things that maybe held us back from actually taking shahada but how did each of us know we were ready like what was what was the trigger? Martin, you've talked about your experience that basically you were kind of bulldozed into it in a way. Um, subhanAllah. But you didn't object either, did you? Like you consented at the end of the day. You could have said no. Yeah, I like you say, I was bulldozed into it, but I knew what was happening. When he said to me, sit down, and he turned around to the rest of the room and mm -hmm. said, sit down. I was like, oh dang, this is this is this is getting real now. Like, so yeah, it was. Like I think we 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 said earlier in the podcast, so some of us need that little nudge, some of us don't, because it'll push us the opposite way. But I think it fundamentally in my heart, I knew that everything was right, but I was just still looking for that way out. And like I say, I needed that nudge to say, okay, do it now. Yeah, I knew for months, months and months, well, years, I think I said, like, mm -hmm. I would have been more like Sheikh Bilal, actually. If I'd taken my shahada in six months, I would have sort of known the very basics, but not known as much. Um, 
but I find that with some of the people I, I speak to now who are looking into Islam and they're like, oh, I'll just read another book. I'll just read another book. And you're like, you will keep reading books for the rest of your life because that nobody knows everything. Like that's, that's the beauty of Islam is you try and find somebody on, on this planet that knows everything about Islam and you would never find that person. So it was the, yeah, I, I so, so like I say, I, I needed that bulldoze. I needed that kick because i would have just read another book and another book and another book and yeah it's some it's a it's an awkward one like you believe in your heart but it's getting it out and saying those words is the the difficult part it's like making that commitment isn't it exactly yeah Yeah. it's it's like like marriage (laughs) it is really it is subhanallah what about the sisters monica how about yourself um i think yeah, I think I, I just, I once I had started the New Beginnings course, I mean, like I said, I'd been interested in Islam for for my whole life, really. But when I had kind of thought, OK, I'm going to seriously look at this now. And, and I think it was from like the first, you know, the first or second class. I just felt this kind of calmness and this safeness. And I just knew that I had found my my place. And so I kind of waited a, a bit longer. And then I remember I had messaged Imran and said, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to take my Shahada. Um, you know, can I do it with new beginnings? And in my head, I thought, you know, I'm kind of making an appointment here. It'll be a few weeks time. And he was like, yeah, we can do it today. I think it was at six or seven. How does that suit? And at that point, when I had a moment of panic, so I thought, OK, hold on. Am I ready? <laughs> um, but it was just like, yeah, um, let's do it. So I was ready for that commitment. And and I think a a big part of that was because I had realized that a lot of things in my life I was committing to actually were were all the wrong things. And that maybe if I committed to a law that actually, you know, that that's what was going to bring me the things that I was seeking so much in life. And alhamdulillah, it it, it has. What about you, Samantha? What was it that finally that finally made you take the plunge? Yeah, exactly what Monica said, the the peace, the calmness. And hindsight is a beautiful thing. When I look at the traje- like the trajectory of my life, of all the things I've been through, all the, you know, the, the other faiths I've studied, the other spiritualities I've studied, the experiences I've lived through my life, and I can see that Allah has been preparing me for a long, long time. And, you know, subhanAllah, things happen for a reason I've always believed that and once I you know I I can see why I had to do this and I had to do that to get to where I am today and you you can't regret anything because it's brought you to to where you are today and as soon as you make that intention Allah helps you so much because I made the intention to find out about Islam and then opportunities just fell into my lap like new beginnings popped up you know, somebody would recommend a book, which was absolutely perfect, the, exactly the style of writing that I needed, you know, things that would, uh, you know, pop up, in, you know, like uh, Sheikh Bilal was saying, um, you make dua and then things happen. It was just incredible. All the synchronicities that I found in life that I hadn't seen before. When you're asking God for a sign, it only happened for me when I started researching and, and studying Islam. So like I said before, as soon as I started um, investigating Islam, I knew in my heart that this was um, me coming home finally. And it was just it, just the case of I'm a perfectionist at heart. So I, I knew that if, if I'd had little struggles with prayer and things that I know that it would, it would damage my self-esteem and create little obstacles. So I knew that I wanted to study enough to not struggle and have a, a foundation of knowledge to know basically where I needed, the essentials that I needed to fulfill my obligations as a Muslim. And once I'd ticked those boxes, I was good to go. And uh, subhanAllah. <laughs> I think I was really similar to you, Samantha, with the wanting to get all the boxes ticked and be able to sort of fulfill my obligations before I took the plunge. Um, I remember I set myself a goal of I wanted to learn how to do the five daily prayers in Arabic before I took the Shahada, because I thought to myself, once I take the Shahada, I don't want to miss any. Um, and that was something that I set for myself, which meant that about six or eight months before taking Shahada, I was praying five times a day. 
you know, and in Arabic, subhanAllah. And now when I see sisters who I'm mentoring and they're like, you know, oh, I've been Muslim for a year and I still haven't memorized how to do this and how to do that. And I'm so casual about it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, is this like a bit of a double standard that I set for myself that goal? But for others, I think, you know, no, 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 it's, you know, step by step, everything step by step. But it brings us to the point that everybody's journey is going to be different and unique and individual. And if you're ready when you know nothing, you're ready when you know nothing and you build it up, like what Sheikh Bilal was saying. If you feel that you have to know how to pray and have to know, okay, do it that way. At the end of the day, you know, it's going to be what Allah has written for you, isn't it? SubhanAllah. So the next question is, what if there's a serious worldly issue holding them back? How can we help them? Per- how can we help a person who may feel their situation or allow them to be Muslim? I don't think this is something we can underestimate the impact of. Martin touched on it, saying that he's had people who are, you know, from the LGBT community saying that, but they believe. And I've had the same experience. I've had, you know, sisters who want to be Muslim, but they are gay. How do they deal with that? Um, Lots and lots of women married to non-Muslim men who want to convert and their husbands, you know, are of varying degrees of acceptance. What, What can we do about this? I mean... It, it, it's very touchy, isn't it? Do you guys have any suggestions? I'd just like to jump in and just from from my perspective, it's just basically reinforcing that Islam is for everybody. And it's it takes, it's belief, not circumstance that allows us to be Muslim. So it's a case of um, developing our compassion and our understanding and, our, you know, being that welcome door rather than the, the closed door, you know? So we, we are the face of Islam after all, and we have to you know, be there for people and provide them with a safe place to explore this religion in in a safe space. And, you know, I would hate to think that I put anybody off converting. That would be the worst thing possible. And so I think what we can do as Muslims is to try and remember to deal with people in kindness and compassion and recognize that everyone has their own challenges and, you know, they they are tested in different ways to us. What's easy for us might be difficult for them. And I think it's just a case of compassion, compassion, compassion. Yeah, it's really well said, Samantha. Um, With regards to the the, the struggles, like I said, mine was given up uh, going to the casino playing poker. That took me absolutely ages, uh, probably about 18 months, if I'm honest, to give up after taking Shahada. and with regards to the LGBTQ plus comments, because obviously that's your struggle is to not act upon those desires. Um, so yes, you could be a, like, I could be attracted to men, um, but that's my, my struggle is to not give in to that sin, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm Muslim. I've just, I've got a different challenge to say Samantha or Monica or Amanda or someone. And it's just one of those things you have to try and give up to, to, for, for the sake of Allah, I guess. I think it's what you brought up is an interesting point. We're not suggesting at all that Islam as a faith permits certain things which are impermissible. Allah says that certain things are impermissible. You know, you we don't follow our desires in this life. And by controlling our desires for Allah's sake, there's great reward in that, regardless of what our desires are. Our desires could be gambling, our desires could be drugs, our desires could be, you know, haram intimate relationships of any nature. It doesn't matter. What we want to do as Muslims to the best of our ability is live our lives for Allah's sake and according to what his messenger brought. And all of us at some point will trip up and that doesn't take us out of Islam. And because, you know, and I I think I said it earlier, you know, subhanAllah, we're we're not admitted to Jannah because we've done so well. (laughs) Inshallah, we're admitted to Jannah because of Allah's mercy, because he forgives the times that we do trip up, because it's inevitable that we will trip up. And I think that this is something that if there's anybody out there who thinks, well, I can't become Muslim because of this, or I can't become Muslim because of that, these aren't barriers. Allah sees your struggle. You know, they they are they are difficulties, they are challenges, and nobody's, you know, minimizing that at all, but they shouldn't be barriers to you asking Allah for his mercy and asking Allah for his guidance. I think that a lot of these things, society makes them out bigger than they actually are. Um, but I think that, you know, we we have a lot of a lot of issues that are big struggles, but by turning to Allah and asking for his help with them, you know, you'd be surprised where the help comes from, subhanAllah, and where the ease comes from. But we have to turn to him and ask for it. Um, Sheikh Bilal, what would you say about these issues? Like if somebody came to you, for example, let's say that a woman came to you and she's married 
She's been married for years. We had this happen recently. There's a, there's a couple of sisters like this in Cardiff. They've been married for years. They've got kids. Like we're talking 20 and 30 year marriages, mashallah, and their husbands are atheists and they want to embrace Islam. You know, we've had a um, case where the spouse is actually actively antagonistic towards Islam as well. Um, keep it secret. You know, that's, that's one way. There were companions who kept their Islam secret for many years, like the Abbas, the uncle of the prophet. He was in Mecca when all the Muslims were in Medina and uh, they were actually at war with one another. But he, he was actually a Muslim at the time and uh, he was actually hiding his Islam. And we have the case of the Prophet's uh, daughter as well. I think it was Zainab. She was married to, uh, I think his name is Abul As, and he was a polytheist. She was, she was in Mecca and the Prophet was in Medina at the time, but she, she was a Muslim and the husband was, was a disbeliever. You know, so it, sh- it shouldn't hold you back if, you know, you, there's fear for your life then keep it a secret don't don't tell anybody and uh, like samantha said you know you are muslim because of your belief you know so we don't judge people it's not our place to to judge people if somebody says they believe in islam then you know we'll, we'll accept them with open arms you know regardless of what lifestyles they're they're living there were companions who drank alcohol and some of the other companions uh, they would speak bad of them. And the messenger of Allah says, don't speak bad about him because this person he loves Allah and is his messenger. But he, he was drinking, you know, so that belief is important. And, you know, if you f- feel that you might get attacked, then definitely keep it secret. One last question then for everybody. And this is an issue that we see time and time again. Well-meaning people who inadvertently push potential Muslims away by trying to encourage, and I put encourage in air quotes, by trying to encourage people to take shahada. As people who have embraced Islam, how would we advise such people? First and foremost, we make dua for them, first and foremost. And then we only uh, give advice if we're asked, I think. So if someone has come to us and is asking sincerely, sincerely for advice, I think that then is our place to try and give as best, you know, as good advice as we can, mm. and we have to be respectful of their boundaries. So, my, like, I would never sort of impose on someone. If if someone's not asking for my help, then you know, I'm not going to impose myself on them. In the, in the same way, though, like if I, if I can see someone is struggling, then off, obviously I'm going to offer my help. But we we have to respect people's boundaries. And at at the end of the day, like we've um touched upon throughout this podcast is that everyone is an individual everyone has their own personal journey um to Allah and we have to be respectful of that and I think it's just giving people the safe space safe space to to speak up when they they want help and not imposing ourselves not imposing our beliefs and and our you know ourselves on other people because the the last thing that we want to do is push people away that's that's the worst thing we can do uh, and so it's just a case of, um, you know, allowing people to speak up and, come, you know, be, have an open door policy rather than, uh, you know, knock, knocking the door policy, if, if I can use that analogy. Monica, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because obviously the majority of people will be well-intentioned um, and whatever they're saying, they they believe to be be true and to, to be the best way. Um, so I suppose it is kind of difficult because you don't want to upset anybody. I think maybe, I mean, reminders are great, you know, and obviously, you know, we're reminding ourselves as remind as well as reminding other people. Um, and I think what I try to do these days as well, just in terms of everything, is to try and think about how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would, would deal with the situation. So, you know, if something's happening, I can think, right, well, what would his response be to this situation or what would his reaction be? And then that reminds me that, okay, maybe my behaviour is not, you know, is not what it should be. And, you know, maybe I could be a bit more understanding or... And so I suppose maybe just reminding, that you know, people who are given that kind of advice that maybe it's not not in line with that or that's being pushy, just kind of gently, you know, trying to remind them and, and ourselves that, you know, he was our, he is our guide. He's who we, we strive to, to be like. So I think sometimes we forget that guidance is from Allah and the, the preacher thinks that, well, I'm the one who's going to bring this person to, to Islam and it's all my doing. It's not, you're just, you're just a means, you're just a tool that Allah is is using uh, to guide that person to to the religion, 
and um, you know making dua is important of course one of our teachers he always used to say man laysa lahu da'awat laysa lahu da'wa so the person who does not have duas if you, if you're not making dua at night then there's no point <laughs> in making da'wa during the daytime there's no point inviting people to Islam during the daytime so we're actually forgetting that Allah is the one who guides alone, not, not us. He's a source of, of guidance. Sometimes you get people, they try fear-mongering people. Well, what happens if you die? You know, you can die at any time. And that's probably the worst thing that we could, could say to somebody. If you die before taking your shahada, you know, you might end up in the hellfire. And it's like one of the worst things we could, we could say, you know, and who told you, you know, that if they die now that, you know, they, they will go, go to hell. We, we don't know. So we, we need to have a lot of wisdom. And I think most people they shouldn't be uh, giving da'wah verbally, uh, but they should be focusing on their character and just generally showing good character to the neighbours, taking food around to the neighbours and just being nice to people. That's all they need to do. Martin, how about you? Because you're involved in like new Muslim support in Cardiff and if you've got people who are like you can see that they're on the brink yeah so it's a tough one because I find a lot like you you might stumble across um, a non-Muslim in the mosque and they've got the the born Muslims in their ear going oh yeah yeah because like they want that sort of confirmation that Islam is true take a shahada because it makes me feel better like I can see it and um I feel a lot of the pushiness comes from that as well as the, I want to see it. I want affirmation, confirmation that my religion is true, seeing people come to Islam. But the prophetic way of giving da'wah is like gentle, slowly. There was, there's no compulsion in Islam, in religion. We can't force somebody to become Muslim when they're not ready. Because I think Sheikh Bilal said, you, they'll walk away. If, if you feel pushed to do it, then yeah, you're not going to stick with it. Um but yeah, it's a difficult one. Like you say, you go walk into the mosque, you see people gathered around going, oh yeah, yeah, so what's holding you back? Why can't you? Let's do it. Let's just say these words and like, and then you're Muslim. And this, um, yeah, it's a tough one. You just want to pull them away and go, please just come and have a little coffee with me. Have a chat, see where you are, see see, see where you are along your journey. And um, and that's what I do, to be honest. I, I meet up for, for people, meet up with people for coffee, have a chat with them, go, okay, so where are you? Like, not where are you living or anything, but where are you along your journey? What do you believe? Like, and then speak to them about next steps, maybe, and signpost them to, like, new beginnings, Aira, like, places that can give them the fundamentals rather than just assuming they know it all and going, right, say these words after me. So sometimes all they need is a friendly face, just to take them out for coffee, and they just need to see that, you know how how you know they need to humanize the the religion. They they hear so many horrible things in the media and, you know, in the news. That's all they see is the bad news stories about Islam and you know all that kind of stuff. So sometimes they just need to see a friendly face and just to humanize the religion, so they know that it's you know it is accessible to them. You know because that's something that stopped me for for many years is that I thought. You know the, the cultural barrier, the language barrier. I thought Islam was something that was out of my reach. Yeah, absolutely, that relatable part of it. I'd, I'd echo what Martin says. You know, we have a lot of sisters in our local convert group, and I call them sisters. They haven't taken shahada yet, and it might be months until they do. Might be, might be tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know. But the idea is just that you're there for them. You know, and they know that there's no pressure. And I think having the pressure removed is actually more conducive to them feeling at ease and feeling that they can look into things on their own terms, as it were. Sheikh Bilal, what do you think? I mean, through through your experiences with new beginnings, when you see people who you can tell that they're sort of on the cusp, what do you guys do? Um, we, we don't do anything, actually. <laughs> we, we just leave them. And so many people do just come to us when, when they're ready and they get in contact with us and you know, if they're ready, we're, we're facilitating conversion to Islam. So we, we let people come to us when they're ready. Again, no pressure. Yeah, alhamdulillah, we, we've had good success and I hope it continues. Yeah, so, well, sadly, once again, we've come to the end of our time and it's been a great topic, riveting topic, and I'm sure we could have gone on for a lot, lot longer. Jazakum Allah khair to Martin, Monica and Samantha all the way from Australia, for joining us for this discussion. And of course, to all of our listeners for tuning in yet again. Assalamu alaikum. And thank you so much for 
having me from from Australia and nice to see your faces finally. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks very much for having me. Assalamu alaikum guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, hopefully I'll speak to you again soon. That's it for another episode of the New Beginnings podcast. We do hope you enjoyed this episode. Please share on social media and with family and friends. Yes, please do share and subscribe. We're on all major podcast platforms. Inshallah, we'll see you next time. I look forward to it. But for now, thank you for listening. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.